another world, another time in the age of wonder. A thousand years ago, this land was green and good until the crystal cracked. For a single piece was lost, a shard of the crystal. Then strife began and two new races appeared, the cruel Skeksis, the gentle mystics. The Skeksis will vow to destroy you. Gelfling alive? The Gelfling! The prophecy! The prophecy. Oh, the prophecy says you must find the shard. The Crystal Shard. The Crystal Shard? To save our world, Gilfling, you must find the Shard. Nineteen eighty-two saw the release of the Dark Crystal, produced on a budget of around twenty million dollars, and it made about forty million in the USA. And I imagine it made enough worldwide to make a decent profit, but it wasn't a huge success. Its popularity has certainly increased over time, beyond the status of being a cult classic. It's been released numerous times on DVD in a number of collector's editions, so it's maintained a steady profit on home video. The movie was directed by Jim Henson and Frank Oz. As many may know, Jim Henson was the creator of The Muppets, and Frank Oz also worked with Jim and provided the voice of Yoda in the Star Wars series. Jim Henson's inspiration for the visual aspects of the film came around 1976. According to the co-director Frank Oz, Henson's intention was to get back to the darkness of the original Grimm's fairy tales, as he believed that it was unhealthy for children to never be afraid. Henson formulated his ideas into a 25-page story he entitled The Crystal. Henson's original concept was set in a world called Mithra, a wooden land with talking mountains, walking boulders and animal plant hybrids. This draft contained elements in the final product, including the three races, the two funerals, the quest, a female secondary character, the crystal and the reunification of the two races during the Great Conjunction. David O'Dell worked with Henson on the script and expanded the story and many of the original ideas that Henson came up with, such as the lords of the castle being separated into two different creatures, remained the core of the story. David later went on to write the screenplays to Supergirl the movie and Masters of the Universe. The production was shot at Elstree Studios in England and many of the local talent were brought on board, such as the Oscar winning cinema photographer Oswald Morris. This will be the last film he worked on Previously, he was well known for his efforts on the movie Oliver, Fiddler on the Roof, and The Man with the Golden Gun. Visual effects supervisor Roy Field, famous for his work on Superman, joins the team to provide the optical work. Conceptual designer Brian Froud was chosen by Henson after he saw one of Brian's paintings in the book, Once Upon a Time. Brian specialises in fantasy design and helped Jim Henson again on Labyrinth. The conceptual artwork for Dark Crystal was released as a book and is easily available. Once filming was completed, the film's release was delayed after Lou Grade sold ITC Entertainment. The new owners were skeptical of the film's potential, due to a bad reaction of a preview to a test audience and felt it needed to be redubbed. The film was afforded minimal advertising and release until Henson bought it off the new owners and funded its release with his own money. The story itself is very straightforward. A thousand years ago, on another world, a magical crystal cracked and two new races appeared, the reptilian Skeksis, who used the power of the Dark Crystal to continually replenish themselves, and hunchbacked neutral wizards called Mystics. Jen, an elf-like Gelfling taken by the Mystics after his clan was killed, is told by the Mystic Master that he must find the Crystal Shard and that it can be found in the home of Olgra. If he fails to do so before the three sons meet, the Skeksis will rule forever. The Skeksis Emperor and Jen's Master die simultaneously. A duel ensues between Chamberlain and the General, who both desire the throne. The General becomes Emperor and the Chamberlain is exiled. Learning of Jen's existence, 
the Skeksis send large crab-like creatures called Gartham to track him down. Jen reaches Algra and is taken to her home, which contains an enormous device she uses to predict the motions of the heavens. Jen discovers the crystal shard by playing music on his flute, to which it resonates. Jen is told of the upcoming Great Conjunction, where the three suns will align, but he learns little of its connection to the shard. The Garthium destroy Algra's home and take her prisoner as Jen flees. Hearing the calls of the crystal, the mystics leave their valley to travel to the Skeksis castle. Jen meets Kira, another surviving Gelfling, who can communicate with animals, and her pet, Fizzgrig. They discover they have a telepathic connection, which Kira calls dream fasting. They stay for a night with the Podlings, who raised Kira after the death of her parents. However, the Garthium attack the village, and Kira, Jen and Fizzgig flee with the Chamberlains, preventing one of the Garthium from attacking them. Most of the Podlings are enslaved. The effects in Dark Crystal are a little inconsistent. We all know the Henson creature animatronics are amazing and were an incredible achievement for the time, but the optical shots are a bit ropey. There are major issues with the opticals looking very washed out and near the end have major issues with focus, but the effects team were attempting very ambitious shots. The Blu-ray release does show some improvement over the DVD, probably down to changes in contrast and colour timing, but it does need a proper cleanup because they stick out really badly. The map paintings though are incredibly detailed and give a great scope to the world. They were handled by George Lucas's effects team, ILM. The miniatures are very nice and really come into effect during the end sequence where the castle crumbles apart to reveal the original castle before the crystal was cracked. The film soundtrack is something truly spectacular and was composed by Trevor Jones, who became involved in the production before shooting had started. Jones initially wanted to compose a score which reflected the setting's oddness by using acoustical instruments with added electronic sounds. This was scrapped in favour of an orchestral score once producer Gary Kurtz became involved, as it was felt that an unusual score would alienate audiences. The main theme of the film was a mix of the Skeksis and mystic themes. Trevor Jones is a composer people often forget about. He has provided some great scores during his career, such as Excalibur, Cliffhanger, Labyrinth, Dark City, and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. The Dark Crystal score is available on a 25th anniversary CD. A text adventure game based on the film was released in 1983 for the Apple II and the Atari 8-bit home computer, produced by Sierra. Apparently, it only took them over a month to program the game. Maybe they could have spent more time on the graphics to make them a little more detailed. There was a discussion of a sequel for a number of years. I believe scripts had been written but the producers couldn't raise the funds and a number of directors had dropped out of the project. The idea of a sequel has been officially cancelled. I don't believe they could have done a sequel but maybe a prequel instead. Jim Henson had said in an interview that Dark Crystal doesn't lend itself to a sequel but you could tell another story in that universe. The story itself doesn't lend itself to a sequel. You know, we will not follow it with a, a sequel to this picture. You could tell another story in the same world, but the story itself is complete. There are loads of fans of Dark Crystal, mainly down to its beautiful visual design. It certainly grabs your attention straight away, being one of the rare live action movies with no humans on screen. As a kid, I was terrified by this film, like many other people I know, the first few minutes it puts you on edge as a child. When the Emperor lies dying, it looks super freaky. And then he crumbles into dust when he dies. It's pretty strong stuff for a kid's movie. But it's good to have strong scary elements, but obviously not push too far. Kids like to be scared, even though many parents seem to disagree and jump to the wrong conclusions, and get overly protective. I agree with what Jim Henson said, that it's unhealthy for children not to be afraid. Some critics have cited the story not being that exciting or interesting, I think many who have criticised this film are adults and probably didn't grow up with it, and I must admit the movie can be a very hollow experience and there isn't much emotion to it. But I have to remind myself this is a kid's film and designed for them in mind. As a kid I found it scary, moving and exciting, but after time I find it less interesting with its narrative and drama. All I can take away from it in a positive light is the creature effects, the direction, visual design of the world and of course the epic soundtrack. So there is a lot to be enjoyed from it. It's just the story isn't that compelling. It's very simple, but it's constructed to be that way. A Dark Crystal is a fantastic achievement in creature effects and puppeteering. It's a one-of-a-kind movie and can be enjoyed by all ages, but it excels 
at entertaining children and is fondly remembered by many who grew up watching it. When single shines the triple sun, what was sundered and undone shall be whole, the two made one, by Gelfling hand or else by none. By Gelfling hand? Do you know what that means, Kira? Wait. This is a piece of the dark crystal. Then that's what my master meant. Yes. Kira, behind you! No! Leave her alone! Give us the sword and you can go free! Just don't harm her! Rujin! Heal the crystal. 